The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. It's one of Martin Luther King's most famous quotes. Former President Barack Obama liked it so much he had it woven into the rug in the Oval Office. We Unitarian Universalists like to make much of the fact that the quote is not entirely original to Martin King. Slightly longer version of it originates with Theodore Parker, a famous 19th century Unitarian and abolitionist. The quote expresses a sentiment that historians sometimes label as Whiggish. The label comes from the old British party, political party, the Whigs. They viewed themselves as champions of progress. In a Whiggish view, history is on an inevitable forward march. Sure, there might be temporary setbacks, even catastrophes, but humanity is consistently becoming more democratic, more free, more prosperous, more equal, and less violent. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. We might not know it when it will dawn, but the better world is coming. It's always on the horizon. This is actually the classical Unitarian Universalist conception of history. It rests on our ancestral refusal to give in to orthodox Christian notions that humanity is innately depraved. Instead, our religious progenitors believe that each of us contains within a likeness of God. With such a likeness inside of us, we cannot help but ultimately grow in collective wisdom. We cannot help but watch the world improve generation to generation. Like Theodore Parker, James Freeman Clark was a significant Unitarian from the 19th century and an abolitionist. He boiled down the theological position of the Unitarians of his day to five points, a sort of seven principles for the late 19th century. Unitarians, he argued, believed in the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man, the leadership of Jesus, salvation by character, and the progress of mankind onward and upward forever. The language is highly gendered, Christocentric, and theistic. There's a lot in it that I suspect many of us would object to. However, it is the last point, the inevitability of human progress, onward and upward forever, that we, we are called to wrestle with today. The words are just a slightly different way of saying the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice it's another articulation of Whiggish, of progressive human history. Advocates of such of you might well select the triumvirate of Parker, King, and Obama as proof of the enduring validity of Whiggish history. Parker, the abolitionist who fought for an end to chattel slavery, and chattel slavery was ultimately defeated. On June 19, 1865, right here in the state of Texas, the Union Army announced the total emancipation of the enslaved peoples of the state. They were the last people mislabeled as slaves in the rebellious states that had formed the Confederacy. And their emancipation represented the extinction of human slavery, human chattel slavery in the United States. Slavery had existed in one form or another since almost the dawn of human history and its destruction in this country and here in this state of Texas was a major human achievement. King, the nonviolent prophet of his generation. King, the prophet of the, a generation who, at the highest personal cost, cashed the promissory note written in the Emancipation Declaration. King, who saw the passage of the Voting Rights and Civil Rights Acts, 
king, a movement that could eventually sing in the words of the incomparable Nina Simone, old Jim Crow, don't you know, it's all over now. King, who died in Memphis, Tennessee, while extending the struggle of civil rights for, to economic rights, to dignity, and a share of the world's prosperity to the poor and working people everywhere. King, whose last words to us were, I have seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know that we, we as a people, will get to the promised land. And Obama, the first black president. Obama, the man whose election to the world's most powerful office seemed to signal a fatal blow to white supremacy. Obama, the politician who could talk confidently about the Moses generation and the jo Joshua generation. Do you remember that? He invoked it during his first campaign for president invoking the biblical narrative found in the Hebrew book of Exodus. Obama drew a comparison between the Moses generation and the Joshua generation, the civil rights generation and his generation. The Moses generation was the generation who escaped bondage in Egypt and wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. The Joshua generation was the generation that arrived in the promised land. In the former president's analogy, the civil rights generation was the Moses generation who pointed the way, who pointed the way to freedom and a land filled with justice. And his generation was the Joshua generation who was charged with the task of building the promised land and finishing the journey that Moses had begun. You might even remember that Jay-Z remixed this narrative in a track he called My President is Black released shortly after Obama was sworn in as the 45th president of the United States. And alighting the abolitionist, Jay-Z said, Rosa Parks sat so Martin Luther could walk. Martin Luther walked so Barack Obama could run. Barack Obama ran so all the children could fly. Maybe you prefer the original version. The arc of the universe is long. <laughs> but it bends towards justice. Either way, it's Whiggish history. Now, I'm suspecting you might feel a little suspicious right now. <laughs> if you read the blurb for this sermon, or if you've listened to my past sermons, you might realize that I'm kind of setting you up. See, I'm not a big proponent of Whiggish history. That may make me a bad Unitarian Universalist. Might even make me a bad minister. There are those like Martin King who say that one of the primary tasks of the minister is to remind the people that there is a power that is able to make a way out of no way. Or that is my job to tell you, as Kendrick Lamar puts it, do you hear me? Do you feel me? We're going to be all right that I'm supposed to follow the charge in our hymnal to give them not hell, but hope and courage, preach the kindness and ever everlasting love of God. But you may have noticed that my own rhetorical style leans a little bit more towards the Jeremiad. <laughs> Jeremiad is a literary form that's often, but not always, a sermon in which the author bitterly laments the state of society. <laughs> the decay of morality. And predicts impending social collapse. <laughs> the term comes from the Hebrew prophet Jeremiah. In the biblical narrative, Jeremiah is described as living in the last years of the ancient kingdom of Judah. During his lifetime, the text tells us the kingdom fell to the Babylonian Empire. Jeremiah witnessed the, holy, the destruction of the holy city of Jerusalem, and he saw his people exiled to the kingdom of Babylon. The text that carries his name records him consistently pronouncing doom and gloom upon the land. 
He's always getting, trying to get his people to change their ways before it's too late. And the wrath of God is visited upon them. The words of Jeremiah suggest that goodness has gone from his land. Roam the streets of Jerusalem. Search its squares. Look about and take note. You will not find a man. There is none who acts justly. The words of the prophet predict God's vengeance. I will make an end to them, declares the Lord. No grapes left on the vine, no figs on the fig tree, the leaves all withered. Whatever I have given them is gone. The words of the, imputed to the prophet are compassionate, but frequently hopeless. Because my people is shattered, I am shattered. I am dejected, seized by desolation. Is there no balm in Gilead? Can no physician be found? Why has healing not yet come to my poor people? The federal shutdown, endless partisan bickering, the acquittal of three Chicago police officers for trying to cover up the murder of the black teenager Laquan McDonald, the rising threat of totalitarianism, children in cages, the closing of hearts, the closing of borders, the existential threat of climate change. These are bitter days. Assuredly, said the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I'm going to feed that people wormwood and make them drink a bitter draft, the big book of Jeremiah claims. These are bitter days, and in these days, the words, you will not find a man. There is none who acts justly. No grapes left on the vine, no figs on the fig tree. And is there no balm in Gilead? Can no physician be found? Resonate with me more than the moral arc of the universe is long or any other Whiggish notion of history. Now, I will admit that this may be something of a congenital defect on my part. <laughs> I fully confess that the Sunday following Barack Obama's first election in 2008, I preached a sermon invoking Martin King titled, Drum Major for Justice or Drum Major for Empire. And I'm going to let you guess the direction I took that sermon. <laughs> I've long had a habit of critiquing this country's political leaders, no matter what their party affiliation, deflating the balloons of optimism, even when the days seem not particularly bitter. I'm skeptical about Whiggish history, even in the sweetest of times. Like Jeremiah, I look at this country's history and I see the tragic. I worry that the bitter days that have come will stay for just a little while longer, that progress is temporary, fleeting at best, and that there is no permanent victories over even the most wicked of sins. The William Cullen Bryant, who King loved to quote, was wrong when he said, truth crushed to earth will rise again, that emancipation was followed by Jim Crow, that the civil rights movement was followed by the new Jim Crow of mass incarceration, that the Joshua generation was followed by a neo-Confederate political administration, that the bitterness of human impression, oppression is an enduring part of the human experience. There are those, of course, who in the midst of this present bitterness would offer us some kind of Whiggish history. Today, after all, is Martin Luther King Jr. Sunday. This morning, we're celebrating one of the country's greatest political prophets, and I suspect that there are another number of religious communities that you could visit today or this weekend where you might hear a more optimistic message. And I know that if you listen to the radio or watch television or turn to your social media feed, you're going to hear Martin King's famous words, most famous words. They are not the arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. They are, I have a dream. My four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. 
And if you go to the wrong worship service or turn on the wrong radio show, you might even find someone foolish to say enough to say that King's dream has become a reality. But we know that that is not true. These last few years, it has been hard, if not impossible, to feel like the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. These are bitter days, and it seems sometimes like the bitterness is growing day by day. Time might even be running out for humanity. We face an existential crisis in climate change, and we squabble about building fences on borders. We face an existential crisis in climate change, and we cannot even come together enough to overcome white supremacy, war, police, violence, poverty, or any other lesser human-made woe. <laughs> bitter days. But Martin King also lived in bitter days. His times were such that he warned us in the non-gender neutral language of his day, we must learn to live together as brothers or we will perish together as fools. Before he was brought down by a white man's bullet, he lived to see the murders of numerous civil rights workers and leaders for liberation. Medgar Evers, Malcolm X, Andrew Goodman, James Turney, Michael Schwerner, Jimmy Lee Jackson, Harry and Harriet Moore, the Unitarian minister James Reeb, the Unitarian laywoman Viola Luizzo. So many lives cut short for the crime of striving for justice. Amid all this bitterness, Martin King. Well, Martin King was prone to Jeremiah's himself. In some of his last sermons, he warned us, just like Jeremiah, the judgment of God is on America now. America is going to hell, too, if she fails to bridge the gap between the rich and the poor, between people of color and whites. If something doesn't happen soon, he told us, I'm convinced that the curtain of doom is coming down on the U.S. He observed that the country was in the grip, the giant triplets of racism, militarism, and materialism. He understood that the choice was between overcoming them and human extinction. And he knew that we were all complicit in feeding the giant triplets of racism, militarism, and materialism. King actually spoke to us about, us Unitarian Universalists, about this twice. Once in 1966, he gave the Ware Lecture at the General Assembly of the Unitarian Universalist Association. The other time in 1965, or 18, 18, 1965, he gave the eulogy for James Reeb, the Unitarian minister from Boston who was murdered by white supremacists in Selma, Alabama. He told us that the question was not who killed James Reeb, but rather, he said, what killed James Reeb? He told us, when we move from the who to the what, the blame is wide and the responsibility grows. James Reeb was murdered by the indifference of every minister of the gospel who has remained silent behind the safe security of stained glass windows. He was murdered by the irrelevancy of a church that will stand amid social evil as a taillight rather than a headlight, an echo rather than a voice. He was murdered by the irresponsibility of every politician who has moved down the path to demagoguery, who has fed his constituents the stale bread of hatred and the spoiled meat of racism. He was murdered by the brutality of every sheriff and law enforcement agent who practices lawlessness in the name of law. He was murdered by the timidity of a federal government that can spend millions of dollars a day to keep troops in South Vietnam, yet cannot protect the lives of its own citizens seeking constitutional right. Yes, he was even murdered by, by the cowardice of every and here I have to apologize for the dated language, Negro who tacitly accept, accepts the evil system of segregation, who stands on the sidelines in the midst of a mighty struggle for justice. Can you hear the echoes of Jeremiah? Roam the streets of Jerusalem. Search its squares. Look about and take note. You will not find a man. There is none who acts justly. 
Theodore Parker lived during bitter days too. He died in 1860 before the war over slavery, which we sometimes call the Civil War, brought emancipation and an end to inhuman bondage. We Unitarian Universalists like to lift up Parker as an exemplar of our tradition. But the truth is, many of his actions would probably make us more than a little uncomfortable today. He counseled armed resistance to slavery. He hid people fleeing from the South in his home in Boston. He even wrote his sermons with a loaded gun on his desk to defend them against the kidnappers called slave catchers in case such vile men were stupid enough to try to come to his house. He was one of the people who provided arms for John Brown's raid on Harper Ferry. Not surprisingly, Parker was hardly popular among the Unitarians of his day. Most of his fellow ministers refused to invite him to come preach at their churches. Many of the Unitarian elite were in the textile industry and had business dealings with slaveholders in the South. He once almost came to blows with Ezra Stiles Gannett, the president of the American Unitarian Association, the precursor of the Unitarian Universalist Association, over the question of abolition of slavery. And so you will probably not be surprised when I share with you that Parker, too, was prone to the Jeremiah. Here are a few of his words taking to task other members of the Unitarian Ministerial Conference in Boston. We see what public opinion is on the matter of slavery, what it is in Boston, nay, what it is in this conference. It favors slavery and wicked law. We do not go to Charleston and New Orleans to see slavery. We can look to our own courthouse. Our officers of this city were slave hunters, and members of Unitarian churches in Boston are kidnappers. You will not find a man. There is none who acts justly. Martin King, Theodore Parker, these men were not fools. These men gave their own Jeremiads, and yet they believed the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. They were able to make this statement because they were both theists. They believed that God was ultimately on the side of the oppressed, a God who in Parker's gendered 19th century words continually commands us to love a man and not hate him, to do him justice and not injustice. A God who, in King's gendered 20th century words, made it so that there are just and unjust laws. A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law, the law of God. An unjust code, law, an unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law of God. And here, here I must offer you my closing confession. My problem with the phrase, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice, is not primarily my skepticism about human progress, though I am deeply skeptical. Nor is it even my own, perhaps, congenital tendency towards the Jeremiah. My problem is that for the moral arc of the universe to inevitably bend towards justice, it requires that there be some kind of divine theistic force in the universe. And I must admit that really, truly, in my heart of hearts, I'm skeptical about the existence of such a force. Often when I go looking for what so many of us label God, I experience absence rather than presence. And I suspect that since we are in a Unitarian Universalist church this morning, many of you might feel the same way. You might find that humanism or atheism or agnosticism resonates with you more than any kind of theistic position. And if you do, you might well also be skeptical about the idea that the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And so I want to suggest that we rephrase the words just slightly. Instead of the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice, 
I suggest the arc of the moral universe is long, but we can bend it towards justice. And that I suggest that this, on this Martin Luther King Jr. Sunday, when we look at the country's greatest prophet, we can see someone who strived to bend that moral arc. The bending was not inevitable. It took great work, and it came at the highest of costs. It was something that happened because an entire generation, Martin King and Diane Nash and Ella Baker and James Reeve and Malcolm X and all of those names, known and unknown, who I have not brought with me into the pulpit this morning, struggled to make it so. And if it is to bend again, if this sermon or any sermon is ever to be more than a Jeremiah, but end on a true note of hope, then it will be because there are those in this generation, those living now, who put their faith in our human ability to bend it. The arc of the moral universe is long, but we can bend it toward justice. This Martin Luther King Jr. Sunday, let us look to the lives of the great prophets King and Parker, to see that they worked to bend the ark. And that it is we humans who have the power to bend it. This is really our calling and our challenge. This is what we must do today and with all the days of our lives. It may be so, I invite the congregation to say, Amen.